Thanks to Squarespace for today's video. It killed three pilots. It never raced. And yet, it became the fastest seaplane the world had ever seen. In 1933, a Scarlet seaplane built by a desperate nation, powered by an insane V-24 engine, roared across the still waters of Lake Garda and shattered aviation's ultimate barrier. 700 kilometers per hour, over 440 miles per hour, with nothing but pistons, propellers, and raw power. And then, it vanished. This is the story of the Maki Castoldi MC-72, a machine so fast, so dangerous, and so advanced, that its record still stands untouched nearly a century later. The 1920s were aviation's wildest decade. Planes were getting faster by the week. Every country wanted the record and none more so than Italy, a country that had something to prove. After World War I, Italy was rebuilding its identity. Aviation became its national obsession. Italy pushed boundaries, transatlantic crossings, Arctic airship expeditions, and record flights to Tokyo. But one prize they couldn't seem to win, the Schneider Trophy. Now, this was no ordinary race. This was the Formula One of seaplanes, a brutal high-speed international event where aircraft skimmed across water at breakneck speeds, win three times in five years, and your nation got to keep the trophy forever. But the race hadn't actually started that way. The Schneider Trophy was created in 1912 by Jacques Schneider, son of a French arms magnate and a passionate believer in flying boats. He envisioned a future where aircraft could land on any lake, river or coast, connecting continents without needing runways. And so he thought, let's make a little competition to just see how good we can make these boats. The prize? A stunning silver sculpture of Neptune in the spirit of flight, plus a thousand pounds sterling. But in the 1920s, that noble dream had been hijacked. Now the trophy was no longer about utility, it was about pure speed, and the nation prestige that came with it. Italy had tasted victory in the 1920s, but by 1927, the British and their supermarine races were unbeatable. They were faster, more reliable, and more refined. And this just wasn't Britain versus Italy, this was also a personal duel. A battle of vision, of engineering, of national pride forged into aluminium. So at the 1927 Venice race, Italy lost in front of its own people, and that was totally unacceptable. And it didn't hit anybody harder than the fascist leader, Benito Mussolini. The Duché was an engineer by any means, but he knew a PR win when he saw one. And it wasn't just about speed, this was about fascist pride on the world stage, and he wasn't going to lose. He had to prove that this was better than a communist government or anything else the West was peddling in those years. The Ministry of Aviation created a new elite unit, the Scuola Ta Velocita, which means the high-speed school. Based at Lake Garda, its only goal was to reclaim Italy's pride through speed, and to do this they trained elite pilots and partnered with top designers, and handed one company a blank check, Maki Aeronautica. But all of these resources and technology needs a leader who can get the job done, so the man in charge was Mario Castoldi. His job, to build the fastest seaplane in the world and win that cup, and he knew exactly how he would do it. But they awoke to some terrible news. Britain had just won the second race. I love Italy, and they have amazing food, amazing landscapes, and now thanks to the research behind this video, I can confidently say that Italy has an amazing history of aircraft as well. But you do have to wonder how the Supermarine S6 became so well known and turned into the Spitfire that the MC-72 didn't also become a wonder aircraft of later years. Well, I can tell you one reason. It's because they didn't have a website. They should have used Squarespace. Squarespace has now combined two decades of their industry-leading design expertise with AI to create a new platform to give you your strongest creative potential. Squarespace will actually recommend a fantastic design to reach your goals when it comes to making a website and give you something that never looks like a template. 
Squarespace has changed the game, but they're also changing it because building websites are only the beginning. Because with Squarespace, you can run email campaigns, you can make educational courses, or if you're like me, you can run a fan website with merch. So if you want to get your own Squarespace website and help the channel, go to www.squarespace.com found and get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And sure, maybe the Italians didn't have access to the internet back then and they can use that, but that's no excuse for you. Click the link down below. In 1929, Britain had secured the second title of three to keep the trophy forever with the Supermarine S6. So Castaldi would need something better than fast, he would need something revolutionary. As I've mentioned already several times in this video, the aircraft would be called the Mashi Castaldi MC72 and it would look like nothing else in the sky. A long slender fuselage, twin pontoons like racing shoes, and a twin contra rotating propeller. And this wasn't just Art Deco, this was engineering as a sculpture, shaped by wind tunnels and desperation. And that vivid scarlet paint wasn't just for style, it helped the ground observers and camera crews track the aircraft at speeds where it blurred like a streak of flame. The Ford fuselage was all metal, with the rear being all wood to save on weight. A lightweight dual aluminium wing carried flush mounted radiators, a laminar surface that bled heat into the slipstream without creating drag. Even the struts and asymmetrical floats acted as cooling elements as well. The oil system had four radiators buried in the floats, circulating through a two-stage flow loop. The whole idea was to cool down this insane plane because of the insane engine. The Fiat AS6. Essentially, two Fiat AS5 V12s were bolted together nose to tail, creating a 24-cylinder, 3,100 horsepower beast with 50 litres of displacement. That's more than four times the size of an average tank engine of the time, but just getting the engine to run reliably was a mechanical nightmare. Engineers went through over a thousand valves, testing 10 different types of steel just to find one that could survive the heat and pressure. It took 18 months of brutal trial and error before the engine could run somewhat reliably. As the 1930s race was rapidly approaching, organizers decided to postpone for one more year to ensure that some real competition for the British could be completed. Now let's talk about those propellers. To tame the torque, Fiat used contra-rotating propellers with two blades spinning in opposite directions, driven by two nested shafts. The result? No engine yaw. There was no pull to the side, just pure forward thrust, ideal for a speed record attempt where every degree of drift would cost time. But there was a problem with this design. The AS6 ran hot, it drank fuel, and worst of all, it had a nasty habit of exploding. During early tests in 1931, two of the MC-72's best pilots, Captain Giovanni Monti and Lieutenant Bellini, were killed when the engine backfired and detonated in mid-air. A third test pilot, flying a different aircraft, was also lost. The cause? Something no Italian engineer had ever accounted for. Ram air. You see, at 400 km per hour, air pressure at the intake was so high that it leaned out into the fuel mixture. The engine would run too hot, and then detonation would follow. The engine had run perfectly on the test stand, but in flight, it became a death trap. This problem seemed totally insurmountable, but luck would have it, the answer would come from the British. A British engineer named Rod Banks. Banks reworked the intake geometry and he adjusted the fuel mixture, and most critically, he helped develop a new high octane fuel blend that gave the AS6 the reliability it needed. It was dangerously volatile, corrosive, and required special handling by ground crews wearing gloves and ventilators. But this would solve the problem, and Castoldi's creation was ready to fly again. And this time, it had a new pilot, the last man standing from the original four. His name was Francesco Agello, and he was about to become the fastest man alive. In 1931, the British prepared to set a new speed record and secure the trophy forever, and the Italians were not ready. 
With only three or five planes completed by the summer of 1931, and initial testing in June 1931 showing that they had problems with the engine, it looked like that Italy was starting to have some problems. That combined with the loss of their ace pilots, and no chance to postpone for yet another year, Italy had to withdraw from the race. The British won it for the third time with a top speed of 547 kilometers per hour in a 47 minute flight, making the S6B the fastest airplane in the world and securing permanent ownership. The trophy would never be contested again, it would now be Britain's forever, locked away in the Science Museum of London. But Italy wasn't done, not by a long shot. If they couldn't win the trophy, then they would beat the trophy. They would build a machine that was faster than anything Britain or even the world had ever flown. And to prove that even without a prize, Italy could still own the sky. Because for fascist Italy, this wasn't about speed, this was about national pride. It was about proving that the Italian spirit could build the fastest machine in the world. The high speed unit had a new goal, break the world airspeed record. Not in a race, not against other pilots, but against history itself. And as we said, the man chosen to do this was Francesco Agello, a calm, precise test pilot. He wasn't flashy, he wasn't famous, but after years of experience and near misses, he was the only one left. He was the only man alive who had trained on the MC-72 and still trusted it. And he knew it inside out. He'd flown its preparation flights and he'd felt the torque, the heat, and the thin edge between stability and catastrophe. So when the colonel in charge of the high speed school gave the order in April of 1933, he didn't hesitate. For a week they waited at Lake Garda, scanning the skies and watching the wind. The aircraft sat ready on the slipway, crimson and gleaming, but the weather refused to cooperate. But then on April 10th, 1933, the skies finally cleared. Francesco climbed into the cockpit and roared up the Fiat AS6, with its twin propellers slicing the air like blades. The float skimmed across the surface and then lift off. He lined up over a measured three kilometer course marked with red and white buoys. Below, the FIA timekeepers held their breath. Francesco passed once, twice, five times. When he landed just over 20 minutes later, the base erupted with cheers. The flight had gone perfectly. But the question was, how fast? When the FAI confirmed the figures, it was official, 682 kilometers per hour. That's 424 miles per hour, a new world record. And not just for seaplanes, for any piston powered aircraft in the world. He had become the fastest man alive. But he still wasn't satisfied because they believed that the MC-72 had more to give. 700 kilometers per hour. That was the new goal and they were going to try again. For the rest of 1933 and into 1934, the team pushed the MC-72 further. The engine was upgraded again, the cooling system tweaked, and the carburetors reworked. Every bolt, every bearing, and every fuel mixture was optimized. And the goal was clear, to break 700 kilometers per hour, nothing less. But with everything about this aircraft, progress came with pain. Francesco tried again and again, and the MC-72 kept fighting back. On May 13th, 1934, the engine flamed out at mid-flight. On June 4th, he had to abort just after eight minutes. A compressor failure ended another run on June 22. And on July 4th, violent vibrations shook the airframe so badly, he had to ditch the attempt entirely. This wasn't just a record attempt anymore, it was a war of attrition, and the engineers and the pilots started to think it just wouldn't be possible to fly faster than 700 kilometers per hour. Every hour in the cockpit was another dance with disaster. And here's the wildest part, Francesco flew with the MC-72 canopy open. No pressure suit, no bubble canopy, just the leather helmet, goggles, and a pair of nerves tougher than the engine bolts. At nearly 700 kilometers per hour, this wasn't just uncomfortable, this was life-threatening. Every gust of wind felt like a punch, every vibration could shatter focus, and Francesco wore a parachute. It wouldn't have saved him, not at that speed, not that low, but it did give him hope. Finally, in October 23rd, 1934, the conditions aligned. Cold skies, calm lake, light wind, Francesco climbed into the cockpit for what would be the 11th official record attempt. The Fiat AS6 engine had already been warmed up. 
The floats were eased into the water, and then the red machine began to move. Its engine thundered across the valley, bouncing off the cliffs like cannon fire. The MC-72 lifted off from the lake and roared into history. Four laps, that's all it took, each one faster than the last. 705.8 km per hour, 710.4 km per hour, 711.4 km per hour. The final average, 709.202 km per hour, which is 440 miles per hour, faster than any other aircraft had ever flown. And no seaplane since has ever come close in 2025. And yet, even then, this wasn't enough. According to the history books, there were some unofficial flights that had cock speeds above 730 km per hour. But with winter coming and budgets drained, the final decision was made. The original record would stand, and the MC-72 would never fly again. And in that moment, frozen in history, a machine born from nationalism, built with obsession, and flown through tragedy, had finally become immortal. After October 23, 1934, it was rolled back into its hangar, its engine silenced, and its legacy sealed. To this day, the Mackie MC-72 remains the fastest piston-powered seaplane in history, and not by a slim margin. Even with all the advances in metallurgy, aerodynamics, and fuel chemistry, no one has built a float plane that could beat it, because no one has even tried. There's simply no point. Because of the jet engine. Once jets arrived, propeller-driven speed records became relics of a vanished era. An era where national prestige was measured in kilometers per hour, where men flew machines that tried to kill them and sometimes succeeded. There were even quiet discussions inside Mackie about converting the MC-72 into a land-based record plane. Remove the floats, add wheels, and tweak the radiators, but it never happened. Partly because the float integrated cooling system was too complex to move over to a land-based plane, but had it worked, the MC-72 might have held both the land and seaplane records. In fact, this was before variable pitch propellers were invented, the key that made planes like the Spitfire fly so fast. Which, by the way, if you've been watching the channel, you know the Spitfire came from the supermarine seaplanes that won the trophy. So if the Italians had continued development like the Spitfires had, it's very possible this plane would have thundered past 700 km per hour. Francesco lived to see his record confirmed, and he was given a medal for it, and his name was etched into aviation history. But he would not live long. In 1942, while testing the Machi C-202 fighter, Francesco collided mid-air with another aircraft and lost his life. The last pilot of the MC-72, the last man who truly understood it, was gone. And yet the aircraft survived. One MC-72 remains, the exact one that broke the record, serial number MM181. It sits today at the Italian Air Force Museum at Lake Bracciano, and I would definitely recommend you to visit this museum if you're ever in Rome or Tuscany, because it features a number of unique and amazing aircraft, and tells a story about rich Italian aerospace engineering history. And there, you can also find the Caproni Capini N1, which we covered in another video, and many other surprises. But back to the hero of our story. To describe it in short, it wasn't just a plane. It was a final burst of brilliance at the end of aviation's most daring decade. It was a machine too dangerous to fly and too beautiful to ever be forgotten. Grazi Mili for watching and let me know what else you'd like to see on the channel in the comments and I'll see you in the next video. And let me know if you want to see a video on the winner of the trophy, the seaplane that would become the Spitfire.